our dear Father in heaven, we honor your name and uh, just say thank you for this other special time that uh, we can share in your word. And Father, as we look at uh, the temptations of Jesus Christ, may they encourage us that uh, we can throw them and uh, we can be victorious if we keep our eyes uh, lifted unto him. Help us to come at the foot of the cross to find help in time of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome once again. And uh, um, I'm glad that uh, we can tune in and be able to share in the word of the Lord. And we are continuing with our series on Minneapolis 1888 and the aftermath. And... Uh, this time, uh, in our uh, number 13, we are looking at uh, the issue, how was he tempted, how was Christ tempted? Because uh, it is from this that we can know that also uh, he was of the same like passions like us. And if he overcame, then uh, we also can be able to overcome. And so, welcome to our presentation. And uh, in uh, Christ Triumphant, page 192.4, uh, we read something that um, when Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit of God. He did not invite temptation. He went into the wilderness to be alone, to contemplate his mission and work by fasting and prayer he was to brace himself for the bloodstained path he must travel but uh, Satan knew that the savior had gone into the wilderness and he thought this was the best time to approach him weak and uh, emaciated from hunger worn and haggard with mental agony Christ's visage was so mad more than any man and his form more than the sons of men now was Satan's opportunity. Now he supposed that he could overcome Christ. Again, in confrontation, page 40, paragraph 2, Christ could have worked a miracle in his own behalf, but um, this would not have been in, in accordance with the plan of salvation. The many miracles in the life of Christ show his power to work miracle for the benefit of suffering humanity. By a miracle of mercy, he fed 5,000 at once with five loaves and two small fishes. Therefore, he had the power to work a miracle and satisfy his own hunger. Satan flattered himself that he could lead Christ to doubt the words spoken from heaven at his baptism. If he could tempt him to question his sonship and doubt the truth of the words spoken by his father, he would gain a great victory. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, we read, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away from the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and uh, lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so the main uh, objective of um, the devil was to lead Jesus Christ to doubt his sonship. If he could have doubted that he is the son of God, then this could have opened a floodgate of uh, other doubts that uh, could have wrecked the faith of Jesus Christ and uh, he could have been uh, defeated in the, uh, in the uh, temptation wilderness. In 2SP 60.2, what were the words that uh, Christ was told by his father? We read, never before, never before had angels listened to such a prayer as Christ offered at his baptism. And they were solicitors to be the bearers of the message from the Father to his Son. But no, direct from the Father issues the light of his glory. The heavens were often opened and beams of glory rested upon the Son of God and assumed the form of a dove in appearing like a banished God. The dove-like form was an emblematic call of uh, the meekness and gentleness of Christ. While the people stood spellbound with amazement, their eyes fastened upon Christ, from the opening heavens came these words, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And these are the words that Satan wanted him to doubt. 
The words of confirmation that Christ is the Son of God was given to inspire faith in those who witness the sin and to sustain the Son of God in his order's work. Notwithstanding, the Son of God was clothed with humanity, yet Jehovah, with his own voice, assures him of his sonship with the Eternal. In this manifestation to his Son, God accepts humanity as exalted through the excellence of his beloved Son. And, um, you know, when Christ came on this earth, I think uh, there was uh, some transformation that took place because when he comes, he tells the angels to worship him because he's my son. It's like uh, the angels could not reconcile the fact that uh, this incarnated being was the divine son of God that uh, had uh, commanded their adoration and worship in heaven. So there must be a total uh, 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 a total uh, difference. There must be a total change when Christ is incarnated when he comes upon the face of uh, the earth. Again, in uh, 1 SG 31.1, after the baptism of Jesus in Jordan, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The Holy Spirit had fitted him for that special scene of fierce temptations. Forty days he uh, was tempted of the devil, and in those days he ate nothing. Everything around Jesus was unpleasant, from which human nature will be led to shrink. He was with the wild beast and the devil in a desolate, lonely place. I saw that the Son of God was pale and emaciated through fasting and suffering, but his course was marked out and he must fulfill the work he came to do. Satan was seeking a dispute with Jesus concerning his being the Son of God. He referred to his weak suffering condition and boastingly affirmed that he was stronger than Jesus. But the word of uh, spoken from heaven, thou art my beloved son, if in thee I am well pleased, was sufficient to sustain Jesus through all his suffering. I saw that uh, in all his mission he had nothing to do in convincing Satan of his power and uh, of his being the savior of the world. Satan had sufficient evidence of his exalted station and authority. His unwillingness to yield to Jesus' authority shut him out of heaven. Again, uh, in uh, 1 SG 32.1, Satan to manifest his strength carried Jesus to Jerusalem and set him upon a pinnacle of the temple and again tempted him that if he was the son of God, to give him evidence of it by casting himself down from the dizzy height upon which he had placed him. This is the scene of presumptuousness. And David says that, uh, prays in Psalms that, uh, Lord, save me from the sins of presumptuousness, Psalms 19. Satan came with the words of inspiration, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan wished to cause Jesus to presume upon the mercy of the Father, and risk his life before the fulfillment of his mission. He had hoped that the plan of salvation would fail, but I saw that the plan was laid to deep to be thus overthrown or marred by Satan. So, Satan was seeking a dispute with Jesus Christ concerning his being the Son of God. I, I'll say this something in passing. You know, in the book of John chapter 1, we are told that um, those who believed on his name, they were given the power to become sons of God. And in Galatians 4, 6, we are told that because you are sons, you have been given the spirit uh, uh, of the father, of the son, crying Abba Father in your heart. Now, I want to connect this. Satan wanted Jesus Christ to doubt his sonship, and that is what he does unto us today. You know, the second, the first Adam failed, and uh, in him, it's like we failed. And second, Adam restored us. In him, we have received restoration, and we are called sons of God. And every now and then, Satan is casting this spell on us and uh, trying to, die, to, 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 to blur the truth that uh, in Christ we have become the sons of God. And so he will lead us every day to doubt what Christ has declared. For those who accepted him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. But the words of God through Jesus Christ at baptism was to inspire those who are there in baptism and encourage Jesus in his, uh, uh, in his uh, work upon the face of the earth. And so this assuring that those who believe on him are the sons of God should be our strength 
and we should not allow Satan to cast a doubt on it. Every time we start doubting, we lose that uh, uh, ground of being able to uh, uh, remember that uh, we have been called and accepted in the beloved that is um, Jesus Christ. Continued on in 1 SG 33.1. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdom of the world in the moment of time. We are looking at how was he tempted. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou, therefore, wilt thou worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. And so we continue looking at this temptation and then we shall look at um, how did he overcome? That is so much important. How was he tempted? And then we come to how did he overcome? In Confrontation 52.3, he bore Jesus to the top of an exceeding high mountain and then in a paranormal view presented before him all the kingdoms of the world that had been so long under his dominion and uh, offered them to him in one great gift. He told Christ that he could come into possession of all these kingdoms without suffering or peril. Satan promises to yield his scepter and dominion and to make Christ the rightful ruler for one favor from him. All he requires in return for making over to him the kingdoms of the world that they presented before him is that Christ shall do him homage as a superior. And this is what Satan is doing constantly in our lives. He shows us the things of this world and the allurement and we are trapped into them until we forget that um, really we are not just not chasing the temporal things of this world but an eternal kingdom. In the of Ages 130.1, uh, we read that when the tempter offered to Christ the kingdom and the glory of the world, he was proposing that Christ should yield up the real kingship of the world and hold dominion subject to Satan. This was the same dominion upon which the hopes of the Jewish were set. They desired the kingdom of this world. If Christ had consented to offer them such a kingdom, they would gladly have received him. But the curse of sin, with all it is woo, rested upon it. Christ declared to the tempter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt uh, worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt uh, serve. Uh, in the of Ages 130.3, Satan had questioned whether Jesus was the Son of God. In his summary dismissal, he had proved that he could not gain say. Divinity flies through suffering humanity. Satan had no power to resist the command. Writhing with humiliation and rage, he was forced to withdraw from the presence of the world's Redeemer. Christ's victory was a was as complete as had been the failure of Adam. Again, we read that um, in uh, Confrontation 32.1, Christ in the wilderness of temptation stood in Adam's place to bear the test he failed to endure. Here Christ overcame in the sinner's behalf 4,000 years after Adam turned his back upon the light of his home. Separated from the presence of God, the human family had been departing each successive generation further from the original purity, wisdom, and knowledge which Adam possessed in Eden. Christ bore the sins and the infirmities of the race as they existed when he came to the earth to help man. In behalf of the race, with the weaknesses of the fall of fallen man upon him, he was to stand the temptations of Satan upon all points on which man could be assailed. So his temptation were the temptation that men are assailed with. That 1.4 confrontation in the desolate wilderness, Christ was not in so favorable position to endure the temptation of Satan as was Adam when he was tempted in Eden. The Son of God humbled himself and took man's nature after the race had wandered 4,000 years from Eden and uh, from the original state of purity and uprightness. Sin had been making it his terrible marks upon the race for ages, and physical, mental, and moral degeneracy prevailed throughout the human family. When Adam was assailed by the tempter in Eden, he was without the taint of sin. He stood before God in the strength of perfect manhood. All the organs and faculties of his being were equally developed and harmoniously balanced. 
But when Jesus Christ comes, he really accepts the law of uh, heredity. In uh, 36.2, the book Confrontation, we read that uh, as soon as Christ entered the wilderness of temptation, his visage changed. The glory and splendor which were reflected from the throne of God and his countenance when the heavens opened before him and the Father's voice acknowledged him as his Son in whom he was well pleased, were now gone, no glory at all. The weight of the sins of the world was placing his soul and uh, his countenance expressed an utterable sorrow, a death of anguish that fallen man had never realized. He felt the overwhelming tide of woe that uh, deluged the world. He realized the strength of indulged appetite and unholy passion which controlled the world and had brought upon man inexpressible suffering. In Luke chapter 4 verse 2 we read, Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And you know that, that uh, fasting is one way of uh, really crucifying self so that uh, we may have a clear mind to be able to comprehend spiritual things. As soon as, uh, that is confrontation that 8.2, as soon as the long fast of Christ commenced, Satan was at his hand with his temptations. He came to Christ and shrouded in light, claiming to be one of the angels from the throne of God, sent upon an errand of mercy to sympathize with him and to relieve him of his suffering condition. He tried to make Christ believe that God did not require him to pass through the self-denial and suffering he anticipated, that he had been sent from heaven to bear to him the message that God only designed to prove his willingness to endure. Continued on, we are told in Confrontation 37.2, Mark 1.13, and he was there in the wilderness forty days tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts. When Christ bore the test of temptation upon the point of appetite, he did not stand in beautiful Eden, as did Adam. With the light and love of God seen in everything, his eye rested upon, but he was in a barren, desolate wilderness surrounded with wild beasts. Everything around him was repulsive. With these surroundings, he fasted forty days and forty nights. And in those days he did eat nothing. He was emaciated through long fasting and felt the keenest sense of hunger. His visage was indeed mad more than the sons of men. Continued on in 38.3, Satan told Christ that he was to set his feet in the bloodstained path but not to travel it. That um, like Abraham, he was tested to show his perfect obedience. He also stated that he was the angel that stayed the hand of Abraham as the knife was raised to slay Isaac, and uh, he had now come to save his life. That it was not necessary for him to endure this painful hunger and death from starvation, and that he would help him bear the work in the plan of salvation. And so, this is what we find out. Satan is always seeking to bring us to a point we may think that we, not, we do not have to go all the way and to the goal that has been set us before God, but only what God wishes is to tempt us if we are willing to go that way. But this is far from the truth because um, the commandments broken and the law which was um, dented, we are told that um, we have to come into perfect agreement with it and uh, uh, we have to be transformed both uh, in character and in thoughts. And God does not accept halfway works. God does not accept uh, halfway work, but um, what He needs is a uh, fully, a uh, fully allegiance unto Him, a uh, fully uh, allegiance unto Him. I, I'll try to read uh, something uh, here. Uh, in uh, in uh, let us in manuscript volume nine. And this is uh, letter 12, 1894, paragraph um, 8, about um, certain we want to deceive us that God doesn't want us to go all through the uh, way. But uh, God is calling those who understand the truth not to give halfway work. He is calling those who believe the truth not to offer halfway uh, work and uh, let me read this half. Uh, this is uh, a halfway, uh, halfway, 
halfway house. And uh, I'll share this on the screen so that uh, we may be able to read together. It says that um, there are as the halfway house. There are so-called reforms which are made to serve as a halfway house in the passage to heaven. Many persons are willing to reform in some degree, but um, when they see that uh, the reformation which the Bible requires is a thorough conversation and transformation, they stop in the halfway house. And they say, I must keep in connection with the world. Should I become a Seventh-day Adventist, um, uh, I should uh, be removed from the position of trust that uh, give me influence with the world. But um, while they refuse to walk in the light, while they have the light, how far will they be able to lead their friends whose salvation they desire? They can bring them no further than they themselves see the necessity of going. Then their influence leads their friends to the halfway house. It leads them to stop reforming after they have advanced a certain distance, which is assured by man's finished judgment. All who are content to stop short of full obedience to God's commandments will fail of everlasting life. And so Satan's mission was to tempt Christ that uh, God just wanted to prove if he was willing to take the path that he had taken, but he did not want him to go all through the way. And that is what he does unto us today, that we may bring in a half-house reformation, that we may not go all through the way. There is nothing new under the sun. We must understand the ways that uh, the enemy um, works. And so, continued on, in uh, Confundation, page uh, 39 to 40.1, 39.3 to 40.1, uh, we read that uh, Satan told Christ that one of the exalted angels had been exiled to the earth, that his appearance indicated that instead of his being the king of heaven, he was the angel fallen. And that... Um, this explained his emaciated and distressed appearance. Satan flattered himself that he could lead Christ to doubt the words spoken from heaven at his baptism. If he could tempt him to question his sonship and doubt the truth of the words spoken by his father, he would gain a great victory. And you can see this, uh, is it in Zechariah chapter 3, the, the story of Joshua standing before uh, the angel of the Lord and uh, uh, just the way that the devil told uh, Jesus Christ that um, he was that fallen angel. So he was there also tempting Joshua and uh, trying to discourage him that uh, uh, he cannot be accepted. And uh, he uh, his uh, uh, filthy rags showed that he had been rejected. But God was working with Joshua and Israel and nothing could um, really uh, 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 could really deter him from pressing towards the goal that was uh, before him. And so uh, again uh, we read that um, uh, we read, we continue reading in the book Confundation Satan flattered that uh, he could lead Christ to doubt the world spoken from heaven at his baptism. Continued on, uh, he then called the attention of Christ to his own attractive appearance. Clothed with the light and strong, light and strong in power, he claimed to be a messenger direct from the throne of heaven, and asserted that he had a right to demand of Christ evidence of his being the Son of God. Satan would feign disbelief if he could the word that came from heaven. To the Son of God at his baptism. In uh, This Day with God, page 128, paragraph 2, angels were expelled from heaven because they will not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves and they forgot that uh, their beauty of person and uh, of character came from the Lord Jesus. This fact that fallen angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God 
and they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ. And so you see that uh, Satan is telling Jesus Christ that he is the fallen foe and he himself is the beloved angel that has been sent down. And so you, you see the change and the shift in position. And so because of this, they were expelled from heaven, trying to shift the position of the Son of God and the angels. Um, in uh, Confrontation, page 44, paragraph 3, Christ knew that Satan was a liar from the beginning. And uh, it required strong self-control to listen to the propositions of this insulting deceiver and not instantly rebuke his bold assumptions. Satan was expecting that the Son of God would, in his extreme weakness and agony of spirit, give him an opportunity to obtain advantage over him by provoking him to engage in controversy with him. And you understand in Genesis chapter 3, when Eve accepted to enter into the controversy with Satan, he, she fell. And so this is what she, uh, Satan also wanted, to provoke Jesus into controversy with him and uh, doubting the words of God and fall as even Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. Okay. He designed to pervert the words of Christ and claim advantage and call to his aid his fallen angels to use their utmost power to prevail against and overcome him. Jesus did not condescend to explain to his enemy how he was the son of God and in what manner as such he was to uh, act. In insulting, tounding manner, Satan referred to the present weakness and the distressed appearance of Christ in contrast with his own strength and glory. He tounded Christ with being a poor representative of the angels, much less of the exalted commander, the acknowledged king in the royal courts, and that his present appearance indicated that he was forsaken of God and man. He said that if Christ was indeed the Son of God, the monarch of heaven, he had power equal with God. So this is the issue. Even when, when you read the book of John, chapter 10, when uh, Christ says that um, I and the Father are one, and when he says that I am the Son of God, the Jewish understood that this was his sonship in the highest sense. And so even um, the devil understood that uh, the sonship of Jesus Christ to the Father was in a highest sense, and that is what he was aiming at. We are told that... Uh, uh, Jesus did not condescend to explain. He tounded Christ with the poor representative uh, of heaven. Uh, he said that if Christ was indeed the Son of God, he had power equal with God. And so in John chapter 10, uh, the Jewish understood that if Christ was equal with was the Son of God, then he was equal with God and he was God. And they took stones to stone him because of blasphemy. And so this is what Satan is driving at, that he may tempt Christ to use his own power when the argument in heaven was that um, he may depend on the Father for his overcoming. He, and we shall be seeing how he overcame. He had power equal with God, and uh, he could give him evidence of this and relieve his hunger by working a miracle, by changing the stone just at, at his feet into bread. <laughs> Satan promised that if Christ will do this, he would at once yield his claims of superiority and that the contest between himself and Christ will there be forever and that there be forever ended. Now, when uh, Satan had failed in his temptation, we read that, uh, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. In That is a KJV, but in other versions we read, that uh, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And that is what we are told that, uh, just in NLT, uh, again, we are told that uh, when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And uh, this is always what um, the devil does unto us. We are told that um, when he comes and finds the house is swept clean, he goes and comes with seven more ones demons to find if he can enter back into this house and this is what we call the opportune time until a season that was favorable unto him and so let us not um, just sit satisfied that uh, we have overcome certain in one temptation he retreats but he retreats you know we are called ships of his pasture that is the ships of the pasture of god when temptation comes unto us and uh, uh we are assailed with uh, 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 with confrontation, we retreat like a ship. 
so that uh, we may find a season to spend with God and uh, be able to uh, see how we can move forward. Also, Satan has copied that strategy to retreat like a sheep, but when he uh, 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 he retreats so that he may lay again his plans anew, and when he comes, uh, he may come with a thunder blow upon us. And so it is always good to keep vigilant of uh, uh, our lives, not uh, bragging that because we have overcome this, uh, that uh, now we can live uh, in a, a life of uh, self-security. Uh, Continue on. Um, in the of Ages 131.1, we read, After the four had departed, Jesus fell exhausted to the earth with the pallor of death upon his face. The angel, angels of heaven had watched the conflict, beholding their loved commander as he passed through inexpressible suffering to make a way of escape for us. He had endured the test greater than we shall ever be called to endure. The angels now ministered to the Son of God as he lay like one dying. He was strengthened with food. Comforted with the message of his father's love and the assurance that all heaven triumphed in his victory. Warming to life again, his great heart goes out in sympathy for man, and he goes forth to complete the work he has begun. To rest not until the foe is vanquished and our fallen race redeemed. And that is what the Lord is calling us, not um, rest until the foe is vanquished. In testimonies, uh, for the church volume 2, 1868 to 1871, chapter 29, pages 209 to 210. Did Jesus have emotional encounters such as the temptation to doubt, fear, presumption, love of vanity, youthful desires, which are temptations to let him from within, uh, uh, from a fallen nature? Was Jesus so tempted to express his will to do any of these things? Let us examine now the evidence in testimonies to the uh, church volume 2 we read temptation to doubt and fear even doubts assail the dying son of god he could not see through the portals of the tomb bright hope did not present to him his coming forth from the tomb a conqueror and his father's acceptance of his sacrifice he was tempted to fear that sin was so offensive in the sight of his father that he could not be reconciled to his son. The fierce temptation that his own father had forever left him caused that piercing cry from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Again, temptation to temptation to presumption. The sin of presumption lies close beside the virtue of perfect faith and confidence in God. Satan flattered himself that he could take advantage of the humanity of Christ to urge him over the line of trust to presumption. Upon this point, many souls are wrecked. Satan tried to deceive Christ through flattery. And this is from one selected messages, book 1, chapter 40, page 283, paragraph 2. He then urged Christ to give him one more proof of his entire dependence upon God, one more evidence of his faith that he was the Son of God by casting himself from the temple. Satan's object in tempting Christ was to lead him to daring presumption and to show human weakness that would not make him a perfect pattern for his people. Uh, temptation to vanity. This is uh, interesting. And uh, this is uh, coming from uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page 286. This last temptation of the most alluring of three, Satan knew that Christ's life must be one of sorrow, hardship, and conflict, and he thought he could take advantage of this fact to bribe Christ to yield his integrity. And talking about vanity, he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and said that if you worship me, I'll give unto thee. Satan brought all his strength to bear upon this last temptation. For this last effort was to decide his destiny as to who should be victor. 
He claimed the world as his dominion and he was the prince of the power of the air. He bore Jesus to the top of an exceeding high mountain and then in a panoramic view presented before him all the kingdoms of the world that had been so long under his dominion and offered them to him in one great gift. He told Christ he could come into possession of the kingdoms of the world without suffering or peril on his part. Satan promises to yield his scepter and dominion, and Christ shall be rightful ruler for one favor from him. All he requires in return for making over to him the kingdoms of the world that day presented before him is that Christ shall do him homage as to a superior. The eye of Jesus for a moment rested upon the glory presented before him, but uh, he turned away and refused to look upon the entrancing spectacle. He will not endanger his steadfast integrity by dallying with the tempter. And this is the point that uh, really we fail much. This is the point that uh, we really fail much. Vanity is one of the strongest principles of our fallen nature, and Satan is constantly appealing to it with success. And we have Harold 26, 1885, paragraph 7. And this is what actually is, it, it, is what it is that uh, Satan is using little, this loophole to get to the children of God, and he's succeeding. Continued on. Tempted as a child, tempted as a child, was Christ tempted as a child, and he, can he be an example to the children? Jesus was, in, Jesus was interested in children. He did not step into a world a fully matured man like, let us say, Adam and Eve. Had he done this, children would not have had his example to copy. Christ was a child. He had the experience of a child. He felt the disappointments and trials that children feel. He knew the temptation of children and youth, but Christ was in his child life and youthful life an example to all children and youth. If you have hardship, so had he. And Mark 72.2. If you have conflict, so had he. If you needed encouragement, so did he. Satan could tempt him. His enemies could annoy him. The ruling powers could torture his body. The soldiers could crucify him, and they can do no more to uh, us. Again, Jesus was sinless and had no dread of the consequences of sin. With his exception, his condition was as yours. You have not a difficult that did not press with equal weight upon him, not a sorrow that his heart has not experienced. 20 Mark 72.2 His feelings could be hurt with neglect, with indifference of professed friends as easily as yours. Is your path thorny? Christ was so in a tenfold sense. Are you distressed? So was he. How well fitted was Christ to be an example? And um, we are seeing how he was tempted and how he went through this. And uh, in manuscript releases volume 4, page 235, you have not a difficult that did not press with equal weight upon him. Not a sorrow that his heart has not experienced. Jesus once stood in age just where you now stand. Your circumstances, your cogitations, at this period of your life, Jesus has had. He cannot overlook you at this critical period. He sees your dangers. He's acquainted with your temptation. He invites you to follow his example. Tempted as are you. This is uh, Revealed Herald, December 17, 1889, paragraph 6. Jesus has said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. Let no one place any obstruction in the way of the children's coming to me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has passed through the trials and griefs to which childhood is subject. He knows the sorrows of the young. By his Holy Spirit, he is drawing the hearts of the children to himself, while Satan is working to keep them away from him. He was acquainted with the sorrows and temptation of childhood. He experienced the dangers and snares to which the youth are exposed. Youth Instructor, February 22, 1900, paragraph 7. Again, uh, we read, Those who claim that it was not possible for Christ to sin cannot believe that he took upon him human nature. Christ was actually tempted not only by Satan in the wilderness, but all through his life from childhood to 
manhood. Again, miscellaneous collection, sermons and talks, volume 2, manuscript 18, 19, 3, paragraph 12, also found in 17 MR 29.4. Christ assumed a fallen nature and was subject to every temptation to which man is subject. Even in his childhood, he was often tempted. Through life, he remained unyielding to every inducement to commit sin. When in his youth, his associates would try to lead him to do wrong, he would begin to sing some sweet melody. And the first thing they knew, they were uniting with him in singing the song. They caught his spirit and the enemy was defeated. Praise the Lord. Amen. In, uh, if Satan knew that there was nothing within Christ that would gravitate to this temptation, would it make any sense for him to even try to tempt him? What was Satan's objective? Would he have tried to tempt Christ if he knew it was futile? Would he not have used the exempted nature of Christ to strengthen his case that God is unfair and just? In uh, Selected Messages, Book 1, page uh, 95, the Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fears, apparently overwhelming temptation that assail man. Temptations to indulge of appetite, to presumptuousness, or to presumptuous, venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of the God of this world, to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. And this is the risk of eternal loss that he was tempted to worship the God of this world. Thou shalt have no other God but me. And so having the other God, then he will sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasure of this life. Brethren, it, it is amazing. It is uh, fearful and uh, it is somewhat uh, saddening that people, the theologians in our churches, the pastors and the elders say that Christ would have not been uh, lost if he had sinned. You think about that in what we are reading. If he was tempted like we are tempted, then it is for sure. If he was overcome, then the result will be what will be for us when we don't overcome. And the quotes are so clear that uh, uh, if he had worshipped other gods, he will sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of his life. This is the risk of eternal loss. And so to have these theologians telling us Christ could have not been lost is really a wonder. And this is what makes most of the brethren, this is really, uh, this is what makes most of the brethren don't want to attend uh, places where error is being forced home. Because if they continually teach this, that Christ could have not been lost, it means that there was no risk for our salvation. And uh, then it always tells us something when uh, it comes to these things of uh, going where error is uh, really uh, uh, perpetuated. In uh, early writing, is it 125? Uh, look at uh, the book of uh, early writing and... Uh, that is page 125 and 124 to 125.1, 124.3. We are told, I was shown the necessity of those who believe that we are having the last message of mercy being separate from those who are daily imbibing new errors. I saw that neither young nor old should attend their meetings, for it is wrong to thus encourage them while they teach error that is deadly poison to the soul and teach for doctrines the commandments of men uh, the commandments of men the influence of such a gathering is not good if god has delivered us from such a darkness and error we should stand fast um fast in the liberty wherewith he has set us free and rejoice in the truth god is displeased with us when we go to listen to error without being obliged to go for unless he sends us to those meetings where error is forced home to the people by the power of the wind he will not keep us the angels seize their watchful care over us and we are left to the buffetings of the enemy to be darkened and weakened by him and the power of his evil angels and the light around us becomes contaminated with darkness. I saw that uh, we have no time to throw away in listening to fables. Our minds 
uh, our minds should not be thus diverted, but should be occupied with the present truth and seeking wisdom that we may obtain a more thorough knowledge of our position, that with meekness we may be able to give a reason of our hope from the scriptures. While false doctrines and dangerous errors are pressed upon the mind, it cannot be dwelling upon the truth which is to feed and prepare the house of Israel to stand in the day of the Lord. And so, when men take the opportunity to preach the gospel that Christ would have not been lost if he had sinned, it really places uh, our redemption at no stake. It really doesn't uh, show any risk that the Father took to sending his son. And we cannot go to these meetings to continue listening to fables and errors which are forced home. We are told that angels see their watch care of us. And so just uh, trying to bring this to a close, uh, we are told, why did Satan attack Christ so carefully and so powerfully upon uh, particular points? Satan showed his knowledge of the weak points of the human heart and put forth his uttermost power to make advantage of the humanity which Christ had assumed in order to overcome his temptation on man's account. Again, Herald 1, uh, uh, April 1, 1875. Now, Satan's object in oh, this is in 1 SM 283.2. Satan's object in tempting Christ was to lead him to daring presumption and to show human weakness that will not make him a perfect pattern for his people. Satan thought that uh, should Christ fail to bear the test of his temptations, there would be no redemption for the rest, and his power over them would be uh, complete. Again, in uh, messages to the young people. Chapter 20, Resisting Temptation, page 81, paragraph 1, we read, The Savior came to our world to bring to every tried, tempted soul strength to overcome, even as he overcame. And we shall be seeing that in the book of Revelation and in subsequent presentation. How did he overcome? I know the power of temptation. I know the dangers that are in the, in the way. But um, I know, too, that strength sufficient for every time of need is provided for those who are struggling against temptation tempted as we are and so why should we not perfect a christ -like character this is a question in youth instructor page 240 we are enjoined to strive for perfection of character the divine teacher says be therefore perfect even as the father which is in heaven is perfect will christ tantalize us by requiring of us an impossibility Never, never. What an honor he confers upon us in urging us to be holy in our sphere as the Father is holy in his uh, sphere. He can enable us to do this, for he declares all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. This unlimited power it is our privilege to claim. Science of the Time, September 3, 1902, paragraph 5. And so, uh, the temptations of Jesus, doubt and fear, presumption, vanity of appetite, and then uh, uh, we find that he was tempted as a child but overcame. So, in his closing hours while hanging upon the cross, he experienced to the fullest extent what man must experience striving against sin. He realized how bad man may become by yielding to sin. He realized the terrible consequence of the transgression of God's law, for the iniquity of the whole world was upon him. 6 and Mar, page 2, paragraph 1. Christ was tempted by Satan in a hundredfold severer manner than was Adam, and under circumstances in every way more trying. Youth Instructor, June 2, 1891. Many claim that it was impossible for Christ to be overcome by temptation. Then he could not have been placed in Adam's position. He could not have gained the victory that Adam failed to gain. If we have, in any sense, a more trying conflict than had Christ, then he will not be able to succor us. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear which he has not endured. The desire of ages, page 117. Again, we need not to place the obedience of Christ by itself as something for which he was particularly adapted by his particular divine nature, for he stood before God as man's representative and tempted as man's substitute and surety. If Christ had a special power, which it is not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made capital of this matter. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 139. 
the obedience of Christ to his father was the same obedience that is required of man. Man cannot overcome Satan's temptation without divine power combined with his instrumentality. So with Jesus Christ, he could lay hold of the divine power. Our higher calling, Christ humanity, a golden chain, chapter 42, page 46, 48, paragraph 6. And so, um, again, what method did Jesus use to overcome uh, uh, this in this world? Christ took upon himself human nature, but daily he linked it with the divine nature. He devoted whole nights to prayer, leaving an example for all humanity. For as he relied upon God, the source of all strength, so are we to be invigorated and refreshed, to be strengthened for duty and braced for trial through communion with God. And uh, then we have this build a wall of scriptures around you and call, and you will see the that the world cannot break it down. Commit the scriptures to memory and then throw right back upon Satan when he comes with his temptation, it is written. This is the way that our Lord met the temptation of Satan and resisted him. As one with us, uh, as one with us, a sharer in our needs and weakness, he was wholly dependent upon God and in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength that he might go forth blessed for duty and trial. As a man, he supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with heavenly current that should connect humanity with divinity. Through continual communion, he received life from God that he might impart life to the world. His experience is to be our desire of ages 363.1. And so there is nothing that uh, Christ went through that uh, we cannot go through. There is nothing that uh, Christ went through that... Uh, we cannot go through. In fact, he is waiting um, uh, to clothe us with his own righteousness. At every step, he is waiting to clothe us with um, his uh, own righteousness. And just uh, to look also at um, some few things here. Uh, in... Uh, in a uh, in a uh, manuscript release volume six page uh, thirty page uh, three hundred and forty one page three hundred and forty one uh, we we read this. Bear in mind that Christ overcoming uh, and obedient is that of a true human being. In our conclusion, we make so many mistakes because of uh, our erroneous views of the human nature of the law. When we give to his human nature power that. Uh, it is not possible for man to have in his conflict with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. His imputed grace and power he gives to all who receive him by faith. So Christ received imputed power, and he gives that imputed power also unto us. The obedience of Christ to his Father was the same obedience that is required of man. Manuscript release, volume 6, page 314. So much then, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself um, sorry, arm yourself, yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin. He came not to our world to give the obedient of lesser God to a greater, but as a man to obey God's holy law. And in this way he is our example. The Lord Jesus came to our world not to reveal what God could do, but what a man could do. Through faith in God's power to help in every emergency, man is through faith, be a partaker in the divine nature, and to overcome every temptation, whether with he is beset. Uh, how we call him? Uh, page uh, 48, paragraph 6. In uh, page 48, paragraph 6, we also continue to read that uh, the Lord now demands the, uh, that every son and daughter of Adam, through faith in Jesus Christ, serve him in human nature, which we now have. The Lord Jesus has bridged the gulf that sin has made. He has connected up with heaven, infinite man with the infinite God. Jesus, the world's redeemer, could only keep the commandments of God in the same way that human can keep uh, them, can keep them. We are not to serve God as if we were not human, but we are to serve him in the nature we have that has been redeemed by the Son of God. Through the righteousness of Christ, we shall stand before God, pardon, and as though we had never sinned. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. Our higher calling, page uh, 48, paragraph 6. He is that ladder. We are told in their fallen nature, people can do the very things God expects them to do through the hell provided for them. 
They can walk and work and live by faith in the Son of God. God is not pleased with those who are satisfied with a mere animal life. He has formed human beings after the divine similitude. He designed that they shall possess the character of God by obeying his law, the expression of his divine Christ character. Christ triumphant, page 53.4. Christ knew that Adam in Eden, with his superior advantages, might have withstood the temptation of Satan and conquered him. Review and Herald, August 18, 1874. And then, uh, again, uh, a perfect environment where all his needs were really readily and sufficiently applied. This is Adam's advantage before the fall. Perfect faculties, mental and physical. Made directly from the hand of God, Adam had a natural instinct and ability to obey the will of God with no internal inclination to disobedience. No need to learn righteousness. No need for an external source of mental and spiritual strength to live righteously. Again, he, Jesus, also knew that it was not possible for man, out of Eden, separated from the light and love of God in the fall, to resist the temptation of Satan in his own strength. The Revealed Herald, August 18, 1874. And so, hence, in 3 SM 140, paragraph 2, the Lord Jesus came to a world not to reveal what God could do, but what a man could do, through faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Man is through faith to be a partaker in the divine nature and to overcome every temptation, whether with he is beset. The Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam, through faith in Jesus Christ, serve him in the human nature which we now have, not another nature. The great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. With the sins of the world laid upon him, he would go over the ground where Adam stumbled. Revealed Heron, February 24, 1874. We are to have an intense interest in Christ Jesus, for he is our Savior. He came to this world to be tempted in all points as we are, to prove the universe that in this world of sin, human beings can live lives that God will approve. And what is waiting us after all these things? A crown. Revealed Herod, March 4, 1875. Those who overcome will follow the example of Christ by bringing bodily appetites and passion under the control of enlightened conscience and reason. Those who overcome will follow the example of Christ. What is the example of Christ? How did he overcome? Sister White answers the question by saying, by bringing bodily appetites and passion under the control of enlightened conscience and reason. Isn't she implying that Jesus had to do this? Bodily appetites and passion are not innocent infirmities or an example exempted nature. Bodily appetites and passion is what our nature possesses. The sparks that light the flame of temptation are what? Enticement by deception or influence and drawing away by our own lust. Temptation and sin has its root in self-gratifying, doing one's will, pleasing oneself. What is the purpose of the will? We are used to express desire, choice, willingness, and to consent and the will to uh, consent. But uh, what is Jesus calling us? Eve and David were both tempted to sin and they yielded to their temptation. Both chose to freely to disobey God's clear and direct command and gratify themselves. Did Jesus have a will as all human beings do? Was he tempted to, to use his will to satisfy human desires? We read in Christ to Unfound, page 213, paragraph 25. As God, he could not be tempted, but as a man, he could be tempted, and that strongly, and could yield to the temptation. His human nature must pass through the same test and trial Adam and Eve passed through. His human nature was created, it did not even possess the angelic powers. It was human, identical with our own. He was passing over the ground where Adam fell. He was now where, if he endured the test and trial on behalf of the fallen race, he would redeem Adam's disgraceful failure and fall in our own humanity. As human, a human body and a human mind were his, he was born of a bone and flesh of a flesh. He was subject to disappointment and trial in his own home, among his own brethren. He was not surrounded as in the heavenly courts with pure and lovely characters. He was compassed with difficulties. He came into a world to maintain a pure, sinless character and to refute Satan's lie that it was not possible for human beings to keep the law of God. And so, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Luke 6, 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that uh, sendeth me. And so this uh, is the position we should take, that uh, we are not here to do our own will, but the will of God. 
In science of the time, October 29, 1894, the human will of Christ would not have led him to the wilderness of temptation to fast and to be tempted of the devil. It would not have led him to endure humiliation, scorn, reproach, suffering, and death. His human nature shrank from all these things as decidedly as ours shrinks from them. What did Christ live to do? It was the will of his heavenly power. The whole of virgin shall be the child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us, Matthew 1, 23. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time yielded and eclipsed, by assuming humanity, he did not cease to be God when he became man. Christ had not exchanged his divinity for humanity, but he had clothed his divinity with humanity. The divinity of Christ is our assurance of eternal life. His humanity is our example. And so many have no real faith in Christ. They say it was easy for Christ to obey the will of the Father, for he was divine. But God's word declares he was tempted in all points like as we are. Science of Times, October 14, 1897. Christ was tempted according to his elevation of mind, but he will not weaken or cripple his divine power by yielding to temptation. And so we shall be looking at how did he overcome. And uh, this is much important as we have just looked at how was he tempted. So we shall look at how did he overcome. And so I pray that uh, this presentation may uh, uh, move us to believe in the divine power that has been provided for us. The same power that uh, Christ was accorded is the same power we are also accorded to overcome sin. And so may the Lord bless us and may the Lord continue guiding us into all truth. Shall we pray? Our dear Father, thank you once again that uh, there is nothing that is impossible with thee. The same victory that you gave your son you can also give us, and you have given us and assured us his victory is our victory. And so help us to grasp the hand of faith in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bye for now, and God bless you until the next presentation.